back on the head mic. There we go. We're going to be in the book of James this morning, going, uh, continuing through for, uh, chapter 4. So if you can turn in your Bibles. You guys are singing well this morning. I like that. Yeah. Um, James is, we, we've reminded, if you haven't been with us, James is a pastor, early church, powerful church father uh, that is calling us to examine our life and see if our walk matches up with our talk and what we believe. To examine our actions, to examine our words, to diagnose our heart, our motivations, and so forth. This is a, a call to the church, James is. It's a book written to the church because of a lot of stuff going on that shouldn't have been going on in the church. Last week we talked about the tongue and the power of the tongue. And this week he's going to move us into specifically talking about community and the church community. Now what does that word mean? Community. This is relationships. Our, our community is not just a place we dwell in, as we think of. This is, uh, we have community with one another. We have relationships with one another. This is vitally important. This is the stuff of life. Your relationships you have with people. The relationships you have with others. So James is going to be leading us towards uh, the importance of community, but he's also going to talk about some of the barriers of community, of genuine rich fellowship with community in relationships individually and community as our church individually. So we're going to look at three things simply and quickly this morning through the book of James. We'll start in verse 18 of chapter 3. The importance of community, the barriers of community, and how we get through those barriers. Right? So you're going to see these. You can imply uh, apply these as we look at the church specifically because we're a bunch of relationships doing life together. Uh, specifically, believers in Christ joined to live together, not only to live together and just show up on Sundays, but to go through life together, to carry each other's burdens, pain, to step into each other's lives and, and really go down together, to die together. A lot of the people you grow up with in the church, you hang around with in the church, you'll be Attending their funerals one day, you'll be attending mine and so forth. That's what we, we, this, this is rich, deep relationships. This is rich, deep community. It's important. So let's read together, in, uh, starting in verse 18 of chapter 3, because we'll, it tags into chapter 4. So would you stand with me as we read God's word together? And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who cultivate peace. He's, uh, I want you to get that out of the gate before he gets into chapter 4. He's talking about peacemaking. This is a fruit of who we are as Christians. Peacemaking. Huge. This is pivotal in this whole chapter. Watch verse 4. Or excuse me, chapter 4, verse 1. Let's go, keep going. What is the source of wars and fights among you? Do we think they just happen? Think again. Here's what he's saying here. Don't they come from the cravings that are at war within you? You desire and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight in war. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and don't receive because you ask with the wrong motives. Back to the heart. James is saying, look at the surface, take it back to the heart. What's your motives? So that you may spend it on your evil desires. Adulterer says, and th- we're going to wrap up on this sentence. And you wouldn't think, you know, why in the world he's calling us adulteresses? We'll get to that. Don't you know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God. So whoever wants to be the world's friend becomes God's enemy. Or do you think it's without reason the scripture says that the spirit who lives in you yearns jealously? But he gives greater grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, so therefore always means look at what was before. Okay? Because of all that stuff, he just said, Submit to God, but resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, sinners, and purify your hearts. Double-minded people, be miserable and mourn and weep. And that just doesn't land right with us. And we'll be explaining this in a moment. Your laughter must change to mourning and your joy to sorrow. Humble yourself before the Lord and he will exalt you. Don't criticize one another, brothers. He who criticizes a brother or judges his brother criticizes the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver and judge who is able to save and destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? Let's pray together. God, bless your word. Bless 
uh, the uh, meaning of your word and help us to, through the power of the Holy Spirit, understand and lead us to know you more through this time. Help us to be a community of peace as we shine a light to a world in distress. May we be a lampstand, city on a hill. Pray it in your name. Amen. So the importance of community. Listen, he says right there, the, starting in 318, the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who cultivate peace. Peacemaking is the fruit of who we are. We are in a, a, a time that is about the individual. Our culture is, in America specifically, is the most individualistic society in history. It's about you. Uh, who you are, you being yourself, figuring out who you are. And this was not the common place throughout history. We've talked about this week upon week, how many cultures were about family, about tribes, about their nation. We look back into the, in the culture of the Bible, and we see how oftentimes, uh, you notice in the Bible, that families would be punished for the sins of one person. Did you catch that? They knew the power of an influence of the community and the people around them and the family. You are not who you are because of yourself. And some of you know this and some of you dread this because you see your parents and like, I'm never going to be that way. And then you start getting up in your middle ages and you're going, oh my goodness, I sound like my dad. Or I sound like my mom, right? The presuppositions you have in life, the things you assume that you are taught by your community, by your family, you are not your own as much as we want to make it an individual thing. We carry the traits of our parents, of our family, and the people around us. Not only wired into us, but we, the things we believe, the things we know, your culture, it's influenced you. And the Scripture understands that. We are instilled values in us, both good and bad, by our family, by our community. And spiritual growth in the church is equal to community. Some of us have been coming to church our whole life, and maybe there's been some change, or we think there's change, or we feel change. And then some of us have had great change in our life from being in a church, maybe specifically in, at Northside. You've come and your life's been changed. But I guarantee you those who've had radical life change have been influenced by the community that they're in. If we just come into this Sunday morning and it stops there, there is none of this happening. There's no cross community happening, engaging in one another's life. That's not happening in here. I mean, you, you hear me and I talk back to you a little bit, but that's about it. The church is a call to be breaking bread together, to be all these things we're kind of challenged in with COVID right now, to being together, to share in one another's burdens, to be in each other's life. You remember parents or teachers or adults telling you as you were growing up, you are who you hang around. All right. That's not, just not old people, young people talking to you and preaching at you. That's truth. You are who you're with. This is who we're supposed to be with doing life together, not just on Sunday mornings, but all the time, throughout the week. And man, I hope at, at Northside we're not having to push that and do party after party just to have that happen. I hope we're doing things that aren't on the, on the calendar. I hope we're inviting people from the church over to our house because we need to be doing fellowship, having fellowship with other believers, sharing burdens, sharing problems. I was talking to one of our church people this morning, one of our, our members here, and just saying, you know, isn't it cool when you hear somebody's story to realize I struggle with that same thing? And not necessarily cool, but just to know I'm not alone. I have that same anxiety. I have that same challenge. I was dealt some of those same cards in life. I've gone through those same valleys in life. We need each other to go through it together. So we are who we hang around. So we need to be hanging around each other. Not just on Sunday mornings. And, and we're trying to provide those environments, but we want them to happen organically. That's what the church is. There's not much about it in Acts. In the early church, I preached on this a few weeks ago, but they did get together in homes. They broke bread. Uh, they went down together. They hung out together. They, they went through the loaves together. They encouraged one another. They built each other up. They were together. We got to be together. We got to make time for one another because we're influencing one another. Think about who you're around the most. That's who's influencing you. That's why the church is called to be together. We're to go and hang and preach to people that don't think like us. 
to people, to unbelievers, to God-haters. But we have to be back together encouraging one another towards truth, towards life. This is the call. This is the church community. What destroys community? And this is what James is jumping into. He's like, do you see the value of what you have right here, this family called the church? Some of us don't have a rosy family to fall into. It, it, things aren't picture perfect. We didn't have a good mom and dad story. This is what the church should be. The, the, the family, ideally redeemed family, loving each other as God loves us. Unity, unity. And, and man, he, James is emphatic here. I want you to get this. A sign of who we are is peace. Not only corporately, but individually. And I'm going to challenge you this morning to think about this. If you have conflict constantly, if you feed on that, there's something direly wrong in your life. If that feeds your soul to constantly be engaged in battle with somebody, check your salvation with fear and trembling. This is why, remember the other day I was saying in the mornings, I can't stand arguing with my, my, my kids when they start arguing about me. And kids, I'm not busting your chops. I do it too. Okay, I'm a sinner. Let me announce that first and foremost. I sin. I enter into unnecessary arguments, but it's just there's too much at stake in life. Daylight's burning to waste time with unnecessarily pain and conflict and bringing it in on things that don't matter. It's perspective. So this should be a sign of us as believers, not only individually, this is the fruits of who we are as believers individually and corporately, peacemaking. 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 We err towards making peace. We step into situ situations to make peace, not to bring a wedge. We build, we build bridges, not walls. You get that? With our neighbors and so forth. We find, as Paul says, I became all things to all people so he could share the gospel with them and with one another, peacemaking. Listen, what destroys community? Fighting. That'll, that'll kill us. That'll kill churches. That'll kill community. It'll kill families fighting james 4 1 through 12 this is where he unpacks this he says these are the barriers to communities to, uh, to community what's the source of wars and fights among you i said they just don't happen the cravings of the war within you the desire and you desire and do not have you murder and covet and cannot obtain you fight in war you do not have because you do not ask you ask and you don't receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your evil desires. Barriers to community, right here. Fighting. And at the core of that is this. And this, this comes down to everything. You're going to see this pattern constantly in Scripture, unpacked in different ways. Why does it take this book to keep unpacking this same pattern? Because we're stubborn. We are hard-headed, right? My life for mine. You hear me? My life for mine. This is our individualistic society. It's feeding what they know humans desire. My life for me. That's it. My life for me. Do you realize that no child comes into this world without somebody dying to self? That mother gives for a child to come into this world. Pain, ladies, right? Carrying that baby around for nine months. And then, not only that, for you to exist, somebody had to give up about 18 years of their life, right? Sleep, parents, sacrifice, trade my life for yours. So you might live, so you might be. My schedule for yours. My money, lots of it, Selah, for yours. <laughs> my time, my... Even the, even the little things, the little things, there's an exchange that happens in life where we decide my life for mine or my life for yours. This is always, a, it, it's, it's funny, um, and I, I did not even plan for this to be an illustration, but I was thinking about this because it's been in my head as a sermon, and the little things we, people don't even know we're doing, as I'm thinking about my wife and I, um, our sleep arrangement where we're in a bed and and I always joke with Amanda, when she leans over and gets something off the bed stand, she takes the sheets with her. Um, and I was just picking on her about that. And I was thinking about how consciously, um, sometimes we do little things in our life, like fold the sheet down. And I'm not saying Amanda was picking on me or anything, but 
We do things without our spouse even knowing it just because we put them first. And we maybe you know, don't we fold the sheet down and roll so it doesn't pull off the person or something like that. I mean, it's just thinking about those little things we do without even telling the other person that just come because they get wired in us to serve other people. You have a hundred different, hundreds, if not thousands of times a day to exchange your life for other people, to die to self. When you step out of a line and let somebody go in front of you because they seem like they're in a hurry, you're giving up your uh, convenience to trade it with theirs and let them have that space. Right? When you uh, ask somebody, that person that's annoying, and you know if they say, how are you doing? Are you, are you having a good day? You know you're going to get this long story. You make a trade. You make an exchange. My life for mine, I'll walk away, I ignore it, or I say, how are you doing? And I give up my time. I give up my schedule for them to give you their story, their pain, their hurt. You're exchanging your time. You're dying to self for the, those moments. It's my life for others. And that's at the core of life. These situations happen all day long. Just look for them. Think about them. My life for me or my life for others? And this is what James is saying here. This is the heart of the gospel. It's my life for others. Death to my ten minutes for me to listen to you. Think about it. Think about the situation. where you. you get, I mean, even, you know, I, I joked about this a couple weeks ago. I think sometimes even in us trying to do good, this tells us how we're wired. My life for me, you know, hey, I'm going to make my wife. I don't do this with you, Amanda. I don't even eat ice cream anymore. But if I'm going to make you ice cream, you know, we, we, I'm going to do a good deed and make my wife ice cream and make me a bowl. And you're walking there going, which one's heaviest? You know, this one's heavier. In the hand. You know, that's just kind of in us. My life for me, right? I'm going to give you a chocolate chip cookie, but I'm going to keep the one that's got more chocolate chips in it, right? Because we're wired my life for me. And our, our society and our culture encourages my life for me. It's all about us. Last week, we're the point. We want to be the point. The world revolves around us. And watch this. This is, this is pretty neat to think about. When you give my life for others, even in those small moments, when someone gives you a thank you, there's a tiny covenant that kind of happens there. There's a... a an air of indebtedness where they're recognizing you enter into community with that person, maybe even a stranger. They say thank you and, and there's an indebtedness. There's an exchange that has just taken place. That's a beautiful picture. Do you see how I was, I was sharing with my wife about this when we were talking about this. I said, I'm just blown away how you see reflections of God in everything. In everything. Attributes of God in everything. Even in those tiny moments and those exchanges of life we see it. Look at verse 4. Or excuse me, let's, let's move on down to what kills community. And then we'll get back to a verse four in a minute. What kills community? Pride. We said what kills community? Fighting. Pride. That is pride that doesn't surrender. Pride that says, um, my life for me. Even sometimes in the name of uh, it's spiritual pride. That we've got everything figured out and everything corners, in it, cornered. And Jesus talks about giving grace, that he gives grace. He resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Biblical humility. So he's talking here about biblical humility. Let me go ahead and read those verses with you. Verse four, where he says adulteresses, and we'll visit that at the end. Don't you know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? My life for me, being about ourselves, is hostility towards God. So whoever wants to be the world's friend becomes God's enemy. Or do you think it's without reason the scripture says that the spirit who lives in us yearns jealousy? And we'll talk about that part at the end. But then he says, but he gives grace greater. He gives greater grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Pride, spiritual pride, pride in our lives. Biblical humility doesn't equal weakness. I want you to see that. It's not poor me -ing. You poor me, like I'm just worthless. I'm no good to anybody. That's not biblical humility. That's worldly humility. That's a fake, false facade. Biblical humility has a confidence in whose you are. It's not weakness. It's not low self-esteem. That's selfish. To be all focused on, I'm just worthless, that's, that's just as selfish as being prideful. But there's a balance that can only be striked. We'll see in a moment, we've talked about this before, the only strike with the gospel, knowing whose we are. There's a confidence because of whose we are, and there's a humility because of whose we are and what we deserve that we don't get, fortunately, by his grace and mercy. Amen? Right? Hang with me, Jonathan Ed Edwards, brilliant theologian that is much smarter than I'll ever be, said this. Listen to what he says about spiritual pride. Spiritual pride tends to speak of the other person's sins with bitterness or laughter and levity and an air of contempt. Watch this. Now he's, he's balancing 
Spiritual pride with Christian humility. But Christian humility tends to either be silent about these problems or to speak of them with grief and pity. Spiritual pride is very apt to suspect others. Looking for the worst in people. How can I catch them? But a humble Christian is most guarded about himself. He is suspicious of nothing. He is suspicious of nothing in the world as he is of his own heart. He is suspicious of nothing in the world as he is of his own heart. The proud person is apt to find fault with other believers. Do you hear that? That they are low in grace. And to be much in observing how cold and dead they are and quick to note their deficiencies. But the humble Christian has so much to do at home and sees so much evil in his own heart and is so concerned about it that he's not apt to be very busy with others' hearts. He's apt to esteem others better than himself. Let me say that one more time. The humble Christian has so much to do at home and sees so much evil in his own heart and is so concerned about, about it that he is not apt to be very busy with others' hearts. He's apt to esteem others better than himself. We live in a time, if there's ever a time, we have trouble trusting people now. And this is going to seep in. That, most of the New Testament letters from the, the church fathers are them saying culture is seeping in to the church. We don't trust people. Let me challenge you to look for the best in other people. It's hard with me too. We just like the first and just throw them out and like, they're probably this way. Give them a chance. Because when we know whose we are, we've got nothing to lose. You understand that? When we know who's our high king, our daddy, we got nothing to lose. It causes us to live different. And like, what does this matter? I'm his. He's in control. It's all good. And if this ends anytime soon, I'm good. Changes the way you live. Completely. We will be known by peace. Hear that? We will be known by peace, by love. John 17, Jesus is reminding us of this in, with his prayer in the garden where he's praying. What is he praying for? Unity with one another. And he says, this is how you know you're my people by the unity and love you show for one another. Peacemaking is huge. It's who we are. It's a mark of heaven, the kingdom of God, peacemaking. We've got to live at peace. Not just with believers here, but with everybody. Peacemaker. Are you a peacemaker? This is the examination right now of your own heart. Do you err towards that? Do you want to make peace? Do you run from conflict? Not be scared of conflict, but do you try not to bring on unnecessary conflict and try to find ways to make peace? So how do we break the barrier? Because some of us are feeling condemned right now as we do when we look at the scripture. Because we're going, yeah, that's me. I, I blew it. This morning, on the way to church, it was me, my life for me, spiritual pride, whatever. I'm fighting with my kids, I'm fighting with my wife, and it was my fault. And it was just, this just happens. But God gives us grace. God gives us grace. Therefore, verse 7, submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, he will draw near to you. Do you hear that? Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. This is the answer. He said, where you've blown it, where you don't measure up, here's the answer. They don't leave us hanging ever in Scripture. God gives us grace. Cleanse your hands, sinner. Purify your hearts. Double-minded people. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Your laughter must change to mourning and your joy to sorrows. Humble yourselves before the Lord and He will exalt you. Do you know what he's saying there? Resist is an active, active offense. That this is offensive. This is being on the offensive. Resist. You got to stand firm because the devil's going to want to take you down, down that road of confusion, of destruction, of bickering, arguing, fighting. Blah. And it goes back to bully syndrome. We do it. We enter in because it takes the mind off our problems. Resist. Submit to God. Humility makes you strong. I want you to get this. Biblical humility, gospel-centered humility makes you strong. Here, watch what he's saying here. He's saying, resist the devil. If you can stand against the devil, and I know a lot of our culture doesn't believe in the devil, but James is saying, if you can stand against the devil, you can stand against anything. You get that? If you can stand, he's saying, resist the devil. Get thee behind me, Satan. You're not afraid of anything. 
Now, this is massive. If you're taking notes, if you don't take notes, this is worth writing down. Listen, humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. Think about that. Humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. And I hope you hear my passion in this. Guys, this is the, the core of life. This is, is peace on a daily basis. This is peace 101 in your marriage, in those day-to-day relationships. My wife and I had two rules when we got married. We sat down. I made her cry quite a bit when we were first married. But we established something. And man, I wish we could establish this in the church. This, it was this. Is this the, the nectar of life. This is, this is where it is. This is what Jesus has done for us. We said nothing is worth breaking fellowship over. Church members, you hear that? And we can work things. We can iron things out. We try to live by this. Don't let the sun go down on our anger. Even if we have to stay up and talk it out, we talk it out. We've got to cool down sometimes and talk it out. We talk it out. But it's not worth breaking fellowship all over. Because you know what? The next person that we think may be better than is a sinner too. And most of the time, it's me anyway. Me for me. Me for me. Because I care about what kind of utensils we use in the kitchen. Right? Because I'm, I'm, that was one of our first big fights was that kind of crud. Doesn't even matter, right? But I'm logical, you know? You don't stir with a fork. You know, it's just something like that. You don't dip, dip pudding with a fork. And, say, and, now, and I'm just, I'm just like, and, uh, you know? And that was, you know it if you were married and you, you get just dumb things bring you into quarreling because it's me for me. I'm selfish, right? This is how you live peaceably with one another. Me, for others. Humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. Courageous because you're humble. Listen, supreme worth and confidence in whose you are. That's humility. Supreme confidence. So both humble and proud at the same time. We take these to the extremes. Humility, prideful. is is, is self-absorbed if it's, I'm just worthless. Proudness is self-absorbed if it's all about me. I'm good because I made it. Only in the scripture does it balance this dead center because of whose we are, we can be both humble and exalted at the same time. Because we did nothing to earn it. We have nothing to lose because of whose we are. That should cause us to live differently. We are courageous and humble at the same time. Our confidence is supreme because of Christ. Listen, I'm wrapping up with this. The main principle of heaven is my life for others. The main principle of hell, my life for me. That's hell. That's here. That's hell here. That's here. hell on the hereafter. My life for me, I don't care about anybody else. I don't need anything from anybody else. I got this. It's what God gives us over to. You want that? Here you go. This is your kingdom. And the world even recognizes this without knowing God because it's common grace that God has given us because we're made in his image. Though broken, we realize, ah, we should probably care about somebody else in life. It's wired in us to do that. But you that have been called sons and daughters of the high king know this fully, that this is the core of life. This is who you are. This is life more abundantly. The main principle of heaven, my life for others. Listen, Don't criticize one another, verse 11. Brothers, he who criticizes his brother is a judge. His brother criticizes the law and judges the law. But he's basically saying here that we are here not to condemn, that that is God's job. Principle of heaven, main principle of heaven, my life for others, main principle of hell, my life for me. The gospel is this. This is it. Hangs on this. His life for mine my life for others his life for mine my life for others this is what causes us causes us to live as a spring as a reaction of what he's done paul says this is just the thing we do naturally when we realize what he's done for us you will never realize how vast and deep the love of god is for you remember i said i was going to visit that word adulterous in the scripture watch this he calls us adulteresses, adulteresses when we're living my life for me. Why? God is, talks about his jealousy, that God is a jealous God. We should be thankful for this. What it means is this. We see God in the scripture as God the Father. We see him in many ways described. We see God as the shepherd that cares for the sheep. 
that's, that's watching out for them because they're not too bright. It's got their best in mind. And we also see the picture that Christ is, we are his bride, a husband-wife relationship, a passionate relationship, a jealous relationship because we're his. He's not jealous of what entices us. That's no competition to God. He loves us passionately. As a husband and wife in love, love one another. This is why he says, adulterous. Do you realize what you're doing? Do you realize what you're flirting with in your self-absorption when you flirt with the world? Mine is far better. The love God has, has for us is far better. And look, before we ever were, this existed in the Trinity. This is what I said last week. You're invited into this. Before we ever were, the Son, this is modeled in the Trinity, in God. Only in Christianity does this exist. The Son praises the Father. The Father praises the Son, the Holy Spirit. Before we ever were, there's three in one. This is a beautiful picture of my life for others. You see that? That's the core. That's the heart of the universe. My life for others. And we're going to get into this Easter. Do you realize that for you to live, something always has to die? Something always has. When you pick an apple from a tree, guess what? That tree, that, 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 that life is gone from that apple. You consume it to live. This is the heart of the universe. Dying to self to serve others. And we'll break that down more in two weeks. But this is the Trinity. My life for others. Not my life for me. So we are in opposite friction with the world. The way you're made if you go your own way. Against the grain of God. Upside down principle is this. I'm wrapping up. Last point. This is the heart of the universe. Humble yourself and he will be lifted up. You've heard this through scripture. You lose your life to find it. Lay down your life for God and the people around you. Up is down, down is up. This is the way God calls us. This is, this is the gospel. This is the truth. To know freedom is to admit you are hopeless in your sin. Do you hear that? To know freedom is to admit you're hopeless in your sin. To know fine life, to live to be who you are made to be. It's my life for others, not my life for me. This is backward to us. My life is yours, is the center of the universe. But you go, you know what? I can't live this way, Aaron. I've tried. I've tried to be selfless. It, it, I always fall back to being a sin. Verse six, but he gives grace more. You hear that? He gives grace more and he will continue to give you grace to live until you're perfected one day with him at home in heaven. Humble yourselves in the Lord, church, and he will lift you up. God's life for us, our life for others. May we ask his grace to live and to abide and to work in us. May we examine ourselves this morning, church. Are we marked as peacemakers or tension, bickering, quarreling with people around us, with spouses, with church, with whomever? peacemakers my life for others let's pray god we thank you so much for that grace that uh, set us free for that amazing grace that you gave your life for us that we might give it away may we walk in the freedom of doing that of knowing you God, if some of us here are feeling condemned or, or feeling like, man, we are self-absorbed, uh, God, you, it says you give grace more than we can ever know. You give it abundantly. So may Holy Spirit work in our hearts. May we call and ask. The scripture says we just call out to the name of the Lord. You will hear us. If someone here has been walking my life for me their whole life and never truly surrendered it to you, God, I pray they do that in these moments. That you make their heart clean and new. Draw us to repentance. Draw us to recognize our selfish nature and the joy that comes from serving you and serving others. And help us to make this a habit so that we might be able to surely taste and see the goodness of this life you've given us. And in, in, in you we do that. We love you, Jesus. And we celebrate your amazing grace this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing out with this song that you know. Um, and um, wherever you are this morning, the invitation, the invitation is always there.
some of your hearts might be changing in the middle of that, that sermon because uh, the power of the word is the word that changes hearts, not me, not my mouth. Faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So uh, we are here for you. Just always know that. We're here to talk with you. We're here to pray with you. We're here to guide you. Uh, many spiritual leaders, friends you might know, talk to them. Be doing life together. That's what it's about. My life for others. And um, I'll be hanging around afterwards, as I always am, to talk to you. Love you. Um, we pray for what's ahead. Guys, if, if we get this, I mean, we're not going to get this down, but God can do this through us, right? This is what people are needing. This is what the world needs. We can come up with our big, biggest and best events and put them on the sign and say, y'all come. But this starts happening in here. This is a place of peace. It's going to be attractive. This is, in, this is written on our heart. We want this. I don't know about you, but I want to be a part of a community like that. I want to be a part of people that care enough that one day when I'm gone, they hang around and love my family well. We need that. This is a, a world more and more seeking my life for me. Remember the gospel, his life for you, his life for you, your life for others. Let's stand together and sing about his amazing grace in closing. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now. But now I see what's grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieve. How precious did that grace appear beyond my first belief. Gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns. Unending love, amazing.
Do you feel comfortable with opening up your hands to receive this from God, our benediction this morning? May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn His face to you and give you peace. Northside, go loving others well. My life for others because of His life for us. Amen? Amen. God bless you.